So um, just to say a few, uh, over, uh, a few words about private equity uh, in general. Um, um, well, it's, it's firstly, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly young market in the sense that the asset class of private equity uh, hasn't existed for uh, such a long period as other asset classes. And then what, 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 and what we'll see, one of the consequences of that is that it's uh, very complicated to measure the performance of the private equity asset class. And that's quite relevant because if you are going to be a private equity fund manager, you need to be able to show the performance of your fund. And, and that's, a, that's a fairly complicated issue. And that's partly because the asset class is, is young. It's also a, a growing market um, because sums committed to private equity have grown a lot and even more so in, in emerging markets uh, and even more so in Africa, which is a kind of probably the smallest emerging market. Um, it's also a private market in the sense that it's more difficult to get information in private equity. Um, th I mean, things have improved in recent years, but it's still a somewhat less uh, transparent, a somewhat less transparent market. Um, fourthly, uh, private equity funds uh, have a very wide performance dispersion, and that's one of the very fundamental characteristics of private equity: is the, this kind of dif difference between the top performing managers and, and the bottom performing managers. And that's very important, uh, you know, for the sustainability of any private equity firm. So that's something to understand. Uh, emerging markets, um, private equities uh, had a very, uh, let's say, respectable place in emerging markets. Uh, and most private equity uh, in emerging markets is what we would describe as the lower mid cap section of the market. So most private equity funds in emerging markets including Africa, are mid-cap funds, which is more or less, um, you know, the kind of fund that you have. And then um, uh, we have the phenomenon of impact investment, which is, let's say, a wider trend than just private equity. But as we'll see, um, private equity, lower mid-cap private equity sort of intersects with impact investment. And I would probably describe, uh, and I'm sure AgDevCo describes itself as an impact fund because Clearly, an integral part of your mission is also to have a kind of a social environmental uh, impact on your investments rather than be just be motivated, motivated by returns. Um, a few words about the, um, the history of, um, of, private, of, pri of private equity. Um, it's really, um, its basic history is kind of comes out of the, the US and the UK in that um, it was formed um, in the US, you've got really two traditions. You've got um, the venture capital tradition, which comes out of the West Coast, which is obviously Silicon Valley and uh, other areas in, in the West Coast. And that's one area, it's the venture capital part, part of it. And then uh, you've got the kind of what you could describe as the East Coast tradition, which is the leveraged buyout funds. And it's not a it's not a coincidence that the, the Americans, uh, they talk about venture capital and private equity uh, when they define their asset classes, uh, which is a slightly different way that it's referred to, referred to in Europe. And then the, in, in Europe, most of the private equity came from the UK, uh, mostly through um, buyouts, but also through uh, institutions like CDC and 3I, which were formed after the Second World War, to provide more finance to, to SMEs. So that's a little bit about the tradition. And the market really started growing strongly in the 1980s with the advent of uh, leveraged buyouts in the US. And then there was a further impetus for growth um, in the 1990s, which was a result of the internet boom and uh, technology, other types of technology such as mobile phones. And then we had the first kind of um, reset in 2000 when there was a kind of internet bubble that burst, then uh, the market was reset lower for a period, then grew again fairly strongly, and then the, we got the financial crisis of 2009, which affected private equity as, as many others. Um, but private equity, you know, recovered from it fairly well, and um, now we've obviously got the um, the COVID, the COVID reality, and uh, private equity is is feeling the effects of it, but it's a little bit. Uh, too soon to tell what those are, but um, please uh, please check my YouTube channel where I have a, a fairly long discussion of the effects of COVID on the private equity industry. Um, a few words about the structure of the market. 
Um, <clears throat> now the Prodecti ecosystem really consists of um, these four these four that you can see. So at the middle of it we have the fund managers. So the um, the GPs, the fund managers, who make investments uh, into companies and or projects. I, I, I distinguish between companies and projects because there are certain types of investment, like for example, investing, let's say, in a, a solar power plant, which are really is more of an infrastructure project type of investment because the characteristic of these these kinds of investments is they don't depend so much on the management team to be successful. In other words, you know, a solar plant, uh, you just need a guy kind of to manage the cables, but it's not like the management team has a huge influence on, 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 the, on the results, which is not the case in other areas. Um, then at the top, of the, the top of the stream, we have the asset allocators. So, for example, in your case, with Agdevka, as far as I, I think it's the British government is your, is your asset allocator, um, uh, and that's it. But obviously, in, uh, in the commercial world, it's more common that private equity funds will have several different types of um, LPs, which can include pension funds, it can include insurance companies, banks, uh, university endowments, family offices, developmental financial institutions, uh, corporates, and, and various others. And so that, that's where the capital comes from uh, to go into private equity. And um, if you are uh, a GP, um, you know you have different combinations possible. Uh, one of the uh, one of the disadvantages of having one big LP is that if that LP catches a cold, you sort of catch uh, pneumonia, uh, and so that that's one of the that's one of the disadvantages of having one single LP. And then we have uh, what I would, I would describe as the intermediaries in the market. So these would be uh, entities like funds of funds. So these are people who collect their money from someone else and then uh, invest in fund managers. So, for example, CDC is a good example of a fund of funds. You know, they have a, an operation where they back fund managers in, uh, you know, in Africa and Asia. So they operate as an intermediary. And then you've got various types of specialist consultants, like such as myself. Uh, a, a good part of what I do uh, these days is I, I, I advise LPs on fund manager selection and I also advise fund managers on how to sort of move, change their operations. So you've got this industry which consists of this kind of ecosystem and sort of knowing the context of it is, is always, is always, uh, is always uh, important. Um, just to um, uh, go back to some of the basic definitions and I, um, I apologise to Susan if she's seen some of this already before so please uh, just drink your coffee and relax for a little while. Um, What's, what's kind of, uh, what I'm trying to capture here is what is, some of the, what is the essence of private equity as an asset class because I think understanding that is important uh, and sometimes it's, it's so obvious but it's, it's worth restating. And what is, the, what is the essential characteristic of private equity as an asset class? It means, it's, it's firstly, it involves a negotiation. So if you make a private equity investment, you have to usually negotiate with a company or the owners. And that's very different from, you know, fixed income, buying a fixed income bond or, or placing an order on the stock market. And what does that mean? Well, right there, we can see that means that uh, if you're a GP, you need to have negotiation skills. And so that's one, one, one characteristic right there. Secondly, you're investing mostly in unquoted companies, and that, that means we have the problem of uh, transparency of information, of valuation coming up. We have the challenges of, uh, of due diligence. And so that, that's another characteristic where that shapes the market. Thirdly, um, the investment strategy uh, in, of private equity fund managers is, um, at least in theory, transformational. In other words, if you uh, private equity fund managers will say, well, look, I'm an active investor. In other words, I don't just buy the, I don't just make the investment and, and do nothing. I'm an active investor. Uh, and, and so we're going to explore that uh, over the next couple of days and see how true that is and, and what that really means. Um, um, and so that's, that's characteristic number three. And, and kind of the, the, the consequence of that characteristic is that the skill set of a, a PE fund manager is uh, specialized, you know, so it's a specific skill set. It's a different skill set than a hedge fund manager. It's a different skill set than a corporate lending officer. Uh, and, we'll so, and we'll kind of see what, what that involves. Let's go on to this um, slide, which describes the, um, the stages of investment. And so, um, and broadly, this is, um, this is really, uh, what, this, what, what we really should consider is that 
we should divide the private equity as an asset class into four sub-asset classes in order to understand it because each of these um, sub-asset classes has, let's say, um, its own sort of implications, its own dynamics. And so we've got um, venture capital, which refers to investing in basically in innovation, companies which are innovative. We've got uh, expansion capital or growth capital, which, which refers to investing in companies that already have, let's say, uh, a, a, an operation and helping them reach the next level. Uh, and really growth capital is, is essentially the majority of private equity worldwide. I would say by, by number of deals, about 80% of all deals in the world are growth capital. And uh, in Africa, I would say the vast majority of deals in Africa are, are, are growth deals. Uh, then we've got um, buyout deals, which uh, uh, refers to buying larger companies. And then finally, mezzanine, which is a kind of specialist area where you'd put the money in as, as a form of debt. And you do get certain funds that operate using just debt. So an example of that would be, which you may be familiar with, is Grofin, who are active also in Africa. They, they just use debt um, as, as, their, as their instrument. Okay. Um, and we're going to talk about all this in depth. Uh, exits. Um, now, one of the characteristics, one of the essential characteristics of private equity, as you know, is that you need to, you don't hold the investment for the foreseeable future or, or, or for, the, for the next generation, uh, uh, and nor do you sell it quickly. Uh, and so you could describe the private equity investor as a kind of medium term investor, where you could, uh, you could consider that you hold the investment broadly over one broad economic cycle. Uh, and that gives you enough time to, let's say, operate the transformational strategy that you're looking to have on the private equity, on the private equity firm. And so exits is an integral part of the strategy um, because the private equity fund manager has to get an exit. And um, we're going to see that um, there's about four types of exits. And uh, in terms of um, someone like your part of the world, like in Africa, uh, you're going to find that uh, the, the IPO route is probably quite is a limited route for exit, uh, and and really we're looking at the trade sale as the main form of exit, or we're looking at self-liquidating instruments, which are kind of debt types, where in other words the company or the shareholders uh, kind of liquidate you, and then more recently we're going to be looking at secondary exits, which is where you sell to another fund, and that's that's probably the most um, the one that's developed most in in, in recent years. Let me talk a little bit about performance in private equity. And um, when we are measuring performance in private equity, um, the most uh, common uh, indicator is internal rate of return, uh, the so-called IRR. And the other, rate of the, other, the other indicators would be um, distributions to capital or residual value to capital, which is what's left in the portfolio after distribution or total value. So, you might refer to say, you might say, for example, well, on this investment, I got an exit at 1. Times, 1.5 times capital or 2. Point times. And so that's also a measure of, of returns, which is used in conjunction with, with IRR as a measure. Um, when uh, considering IRR, we should consider that there's about two, two levels of IRR. One is, um, one is going to be a gross IRR, which is the the return at the portfolio level before you deduct fees uh, to the fund manager, and then the net IRR is is the um, is the return to the to the LPs after the fund manager's fees. So, uh, conceivably, you could have a fund manager who is not as good but charges lower fees, and the, his investors would get more net than a good fund manager who has bigger fees. Although that's you know very rare in practice. And so, so those are the two, those are the two you know, main measures in, in the industry. Um, one thing to, to bear in mind, and, and it's, uh, it's something that you should always be uh, fairly versed on uh, when we're having the, the debate about private equity, is, is clearly the, the industry. So the private equity industry uh, is, is obviously part of your job as a fund manager is to market the asset class, to, to sort of say, well, you know, private equity is a good thing. And so the, the industry is, is keen to support the claims that, um, you know, particularly good performing managers uh, provide a great performance for the investors. Because if the asset class doesn't uh, perform, obviously uh, 
it's not going to continue to, to exist. Um, the reasons given for, for private equity outperforming, say, for example, the stock market is, you know, that the fund manager has better access to information, that the, the GPs um, have expertise in managing investments. You can use leverage on companies to inc improve your return and motivate managers more and so on and so forth. What is the evidence in the market today? Well, let me, um, let me share with you some of the principal studies that have been um, uh, conducted in, in the industry about the private equity um, asset class. And um, these are the, the most recent one is one by a friend of mine, Ludovic Filippo, who is a professor at uh, Oxford Business School. Um, first, the first study was made by two academics called Kaplan and Shoah, and they use a, a method called the public market equivalent. And that means you compare the performance of private equity asset class to the stock market. And uh, if you want to know how that works in detail, please look at one of my the YouTube video that's referenced at the end of this uh, lecture to explain how that works. Uh, and it's, it's generally accepted as the method of choice to assess private equity, to assess private equity fund managers. And so they studied a basket of investments uh, this study was done in 2005 and they found that private equity did actually did worse than the stock market equivalent by between 4% and 26% depending on the statistical method used. So their study suggests that it's not worth your while putting money in private equity because you're better off in the stock market. Then there was a study done in 2008 by Boston Consulting Group and uh, Spanish Business School ESA. And they found that the private equity uh, investments they studied did better than the stock market by, they did 13%, the stock market did 10%, so they beat the stock market by, relatively, by 30%. Then in 2009, there was a study done by two academics, Filippo and Gottschalk, and they found that uh, private equity did worse than the stock market index by between 3 and 6%, so more or less the same. Then in 2011, there was another study done which showed that private equity beat the stock market equivalent by about 15%. And the most recent study by Ludovic Filippo in 2020 found that the private equity industry, on average, did no better than the, than the stock market, which, uh, which actually caused a little bit of a furore in the market. And if you, um, if you look up Ludovic Filippo on LinkedIn, you'll find some quite interesting comments. And... Um, if you click these links uh, a bit later, you'll, there'll be some more details about what PME is and how, how it exactly works. But basically, the, the academic studies made over the years seem to suggest that um, private equity as an asset class uh, doesn't do a particularly better than the stock market or, on average. Whereas most industri industry players, uh, particularly some of the big funds, would claim that they outperform the stock market by a certain amount, by 3% a year or something like that. So there's a, a kind of a debate going on, and measuring the performance is complicated statistically. And so if you're interested in learning more about this, uh, please, uh, please, please do so. But it's, 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 it's important for you to know, you know what the debate is these days, because that, 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 that may come up you know, in conversation if you're a fund manager. Um, here's an example of how complicated the statistics can get. If you see this slide, you can see how difficult it is to really measure it. For example, if we look at the first row, which is Cambridge Associates Global Developed Markets without considering the US, if you look at the column 10 year, you see that private equity as an asset class returned 9.9%. Then if we look at uh, the row, the blue row, Cambridge Associates Emerging Markets, um, it returned 11%. So that's something interesting for you guys because you're in emerging markets. So looking back uh, over a 10-year cycle, you know, your asset class returned 11%, which is a fairly, good, a fairly good return. And then if you look at the rows below that, these refer to several stock market indexes. And so you can, you can compare. So for example, if we take the 10-year column and we look at CA emerging markets at 10.9%, we can compare that to the MSCI Emerging Markets Index, which is the row just below that, which is at 1.9, which is pretty good. So, 
emerging markets returned 11% and the index returned 2 And so private equity in emerging markets beat the index by 8%, which is a very strong case for, for, for private equity. But if you look at, you just have to look at the numbers looking at different time horizons and different markets to see how, how the numbers, you know, change so much. And so it is, it is a complicated debate because you have to know, you know, what numbers you're, you're talking about. But all the evidence suggests that, um, that emerging market private equity returns are not particularly different. Um, emerging markets returns on average are not sp sp particularly different than developed markets or only by a little bit and as far as Africa is concerned I think the statistics uh, the market is still too young for there to be you know lots of meaningful statistics yet so it's something that's good for you to be to be aware of and, and that is one of the issues challenges you have in emerging markets is that um, is that uh, many big investors you know like a pension fund in the US will simply say look well you know the emerging markets asset class, uh, private equity asset class, doesn't do particularly better than my American one, so why should I bother investing in emerging markets and have all the kind of, um, you know, the headaches of managing that. And so what that does is for in emerging markets private equity, you have a significantly smaller universe of, of, of LPs, uh, which means in practice there's a big role for developmental institutions who have, you know, motives to invest which are not just purely financial. Um, this gets on to the next uh, aspect, let's say, of private equity returns, which is the, um, the question of return dispersion. And so what this is all about is, if you look at this statistic, which I've, I've, chosen, I've chosen at random, here we, we're looking at the returns of European private equity at the end of 2013. It, it could have been something else. But if you look at it, um, if you look at the table on the left, you will see that all private equity returned 9.24%. So in average, so in that specific year, in the year 2013, looking back 10 years, the asset class in Europe returned 9.24%, which is not much different from the 10.9 we saw earlier or all the others. So, so there's a kind of general kind of average value of kind of 10, 11, 12 that sort of persists. But what's interesting to look at here isn't so much the average of 9.24, but it's to look at the difference between the, um, the, the component parts. And so what, this, what we see on this uh, bar chart on the right is they break this out into the fund managers. So the top quarter of fund managers uh, uh, returned on average 21%, 20.82. 20 the second quartile returned 6%. The third quartile returned minus one and a half, and the bottom quartile minus nine. And so what this shows is that the difference between the top fund manager is 21 and the bottom one at minus nine. So there's a, a, a huge difference, which is about 30% a year, uh, a 30% difference between the top man, fund manager and the worst one. And that's, that's one of the characteristics of private equity um, which is, you know, very, very important and very talked about. So the two, the, so, so the, two, the two main things about performance is, number one, it's the fact that the average return is something around 10. It, it's comparable to the stock market. Sometimes it's a couple of points better, but that's more or less it. And the other important aspect of, the, of, of it is the fact that um, you have this very big difference between top performing and, uh, and bottom performing uh, fund managers. And so that is the case everywhere. You know, that's the case in uh, Europe, it's the case in the US, and it's certainly the, the, you know, it's certainly going to be the case, it is the case in Africa. And so um, hopefully Agdevco is going to be <clears throat> one of the top performers. Uh, but somebody has to be in the bottom as well, right? And um, if we look at this, uh, this chart here, the, the best way to think about it is, uh, let's say statistically, is if we compare a, a private equity fund manager to a, a mutual fund manager. So somebody who manages a portfolio of quoted blue chip, uh, of quoted blue chip stocks. What you find is that um, the, um, we've seen that the average return of quoted shares is not a, a whole lot different of, than the average return of private equity. 
But the big difference is that um, the average, if uh, the average mutual fund manager, if he's having he or she is having a not not very good year, they might be a couple of points below the index. If they're having a very good year, <clears throat> they might be a couple of points above the index. As we've seen, in the case of private equity fund managers, there's this huge dispersion. And so what's important is, you know, that, that's what's something that investors are going to be concentrating on and, and, and asking, you know, and benchmarking. So it's an essential characteristic of the industry which doesn't really change. Um, <clears throat> so those are, those are kind of some, let's say, some of the key aspects about performance of private equity and, and, and anybody working in the industry should certainly be aware of it in, in broad terms. The other two, the other, the other uh, important thing to be aware of in the industry uh, globally is about what regulation does, what regulation exists in the private equity industry. Um, now, um, the the two main regulations are quite recent, and they were a result of the financial crisis. And the reason they are, they have an impact is they, they, that people will look to those regulations as models in other jurisdictions. And so the first one was the, United, the, the U.S. called uh, the Frank Dobb, Dobb Act from the U.S. And it's part of the financial reforms uh, that were passed by the U.S., which requires uh, some of the bigger leveraged buyout funds to register with the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is basically the U.S. authorities. And the second major regulation that came out is the European Union Directive on Alternative Fund Managers. And that has uh, an impact also on other markets, such as Africa, the Middle East, or emerging Europe, because many LPs will now say to people, well, you know, is your, is your fund compliant with EU regulations? Or, you know, can your fund manager be registered in, in the European Union and uh, be approved as a, as, a, as a compliant fund manager? So that, that does have an, a knock-on effect on emerging markets. So it's, it's good to have some, 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 some knowledge of that, particularly in, um, in your time zone, because I think the, um, the European influence is stronger than the US one in terms of regulations and practices in, in Africa. Um, the other thing uh, that's an essential characteristic of private equity, apart from actual regulation by an authority, US or European Union, is uh, self-regulation. IPEF stands for International Private Equity Valuation. It's a not-for-profit not association founded by um, the industry. So by LPs and GPs, it's based in London. And what it does is it publishes best practices. So it publishes it issues publications on what's best practice for valuing the portfolio and it issues publications for what's best practice for um, reporting to your own investors. And so it's, 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 it's probably a good idea for everybody to be familiar with IPEV and, and just have a general idea about their publications and we're going, to, we're going to talk about that in the next module. The other important body is called the ILPA, International uh, limited Partners Association, and that is a body based out of Washington, and that is also the, the kind of second big uh, body which is having a big influence. So when we go to our investors, they say, well, you know, is your fund compliant with IPEV standards? And we say, yes, and for them it's a tick in the box. So the, there is, these standards are going to continue to, uh, continue to have a big influence. And IPEV seems to be, IPEV and RPA seem to be the two standards that are emerging. So it's kind of important to sort of know about them in, in general terms. So I would encourage you to do so. And um, you can watch one of my um, subsequent videos where I go into more detail. Okay, so that's about regulation. Oh, one, one last thing I'll say about regulation is um, the, other, the only other regulation having an impact on private equity are the greater disclosure requirements on offshore centers because... As you may know, many private equity funds will be incorporated in an offshore jurisdiction like, for example, Jersey or the Isle of Man or the Cayman Islands and such. And these are coming under greater regulation. So that will also have some impact, although that regulation isn't specifically directed at private equity funds, but more at tightening up regulations of offshore jurisdictions. OK, um, regarding um, private equity emerging markets, I would say that, uh, broadly speaking, we've got um, these emerging markets that you can see on this graph here. So we've got um, emerging Europe, we've got the Middle East and North Africa, we've got Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America and, and emerging Asia. More or less, uh, if we look at the size of the markets of these five main emerging market blocks,
the uh, emerging Asia, which is uh, you know, China, India, and Southeast Asia, accounts for about two-thirds of the market. And emerging markets accounts for about 20% of the total private equity market, broadly speaking. And um, so that leaves, um, that leaves about uh, one-third after emerging Asia. Uh, and after emerging Asia, we've got, um, we've got Latin America um, and emerging Europe. And then after emerging Europe and Latin America, we've got the two smallest ones, which is the Middle East and North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa is obviously the one that's got this uh, huge potential. Um, you know, as you know, um, I, I've worked in private equity in Nigeria, for example, for many years. You know, you've got this country with 170 million people. Um, you know, so the Sub-Saharan market itself you know, is more or less divided into the kind of West African section, which is Nigeria plus, you know, Senegal, Ghana and some others. Then we've got kind of East Africa, which has the characteristic of not having one predominantly large country, but a kind of constellation of countries such as, you know, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Ethiopia and others. And then we've kind of got the South African hub, which consists of, you know, South Africa, Namibia, Tanzania and others. So there's kind of three, three general constellations. And if you look at African fund managers, you'll find that, um, you know, many of them will be working in one of those three areas, and then we've got a certain number of pan-African managers. Um, just to give you a general idea, it's, there's about, it's estimated by McKinsey that there's about 7,000 private equity firms globally, and um, I think it's the African Venture Capital Association estimates that in Africa, there's about 250 fund manager firms, which is not, not very many. And so you, you guys are clearly one, one of those. But for a continent that size, clearly there's going to be room for, room, room for growth. Um, how do funds specialize? Because uh, one, of the, one, of the, um, one of the main debates in private equity is always about um, how do funds basically position themselves? And how, do fun, how can funds specialize? Well, they can do it in, in basically six ways. And, and it's always useful to be to kind of be aware of that. They can specialize by instrument. So what kind of financial instrument they, they make use of. So to give you an example you may be familiar with, like, you know, for example, Grofin specializes in, in, in the fact that they use only self-liquidating instruments. So like a, a, debt, a debt instrument. They can specialize by stage. You know, you can specialize by only investing in startups or only investing in mature companies, but you know, that may not necessarily be the case. You could specialize by sector. Um, it's still, um, private equity funds that specialize by sector are still somewhat of a minority. Those that do, it's typically agribusiness, like, your, like your, you guys, or, or financial services, telecoms, but probably no more than, at, at the most, 20% of uh, all fund management firms specialized by sector, so that, that's, that's probably, you know, it's, a, it's still not a big thing. By geography, obviously, region or country. It's sometimes by situation, you know, you, you may specialize in privatization funds or distressed. Uh, to give you an example of the Italian private equity industry, where I worked for many years, some, years, some time ago, uh, you specialize in succession. So, for example, most of the Italian private equity industry is concerned with these uh, family-owned companies in the north of Italy where the founder doesn't have any children to take over the business and private equity kind of inserts itself into that narrative. And that's also something you may see in Africa. Or returns objectives as the sixth area of specialization. So, for example, you know, you may have a fund like, uh, uh, you know, obviously very topically the, an impact fund which has a dual objective where they're trying to have, earn an economic return on their capital, but also have a social, environmental, etc. impact. And so that's also a way of specializing. So if I take the example of uh, AgDevCo, you know, you, you, can, you, you need to be specialized to some extent, but you, you mustn't be over-specialized, otherwise you may not have a sustainable business. And the general rule is that the more the market is developed, the more you need to specialize in order to, be, to have a competitive advantage. So... Um, uh, and so Africa still being something of an emerging market, uh, clearly there's quite a lot of room still for generalist funds uh, in the market. So if you're a generalist funds, in terms of sector, you probably need to specialize more by geography. So, so there's always this trade-off you need to make.
And so <clears throat> what are the four fundamental asset classes that we, that we find in the industry? Well, it's buyouts, uh, expansion, venture, and, uh, and mezzanine. Uh, the relation with the company life cycle, we can see with this, uh, with this curve. So, you know, the venture refers to the early stage of a company's life. Expansion sort of kind of refers to the stage when the company is formed, but it, take, it, take, it goes up to the next level. So, you know, a very good example of an expansion capital investment would be, well, let me think of a concrete example, um, Egypt. I was, uh, I, was advising, um, I was advising a private equity fund there uh, about a year and a half ago. And so we had this company in Egypt that was a, a, peanut, butter, a peanut manufacturer. So they produce peanuts. It's quite big in Egypt. And what happened was this company was producing peanuts and selling it to a Dutch partner. And what basically happened was that the company was you know, doing quite well, reached a certain size. And then the son, who was taking over from the father, who was in his 70s, the son was in his 30s, had gone to business school in the US, etc., wanted to um, build a new factory. And he wanted to get into peanut butter and diversify and go into more high value added areas. And so the investment was to take an existing company and take it to the next level. So it was all about, um, you know, the succession from the son taking over from the father and introducing more modern management techniques and things like that. Now, what, are, what are some of the characteristics of the four, let's call them ecosystems, because they've got these, um, they've got some specific characteristics. So in venture, uh, uh, deal sourcing is quite an important thing in, in venture because one of the one of the issues in, in venture is you've actually got to go and discover the company, as it were, which is not so much the case, you know, wh where we're doing bigger deals where people know about the companies and it's more a question of, uh, you know, waiting for the opportunity to present itself. And so that's one part of it. Um, when we're talking about venture, the, the instruments usually are equity instruments because you can't give debt to the company because it can't support it. And another big, uh, another characteristic of venture is that um, you will get some uh, bankrupt companies in your portfolio because th there'll be a few kind of very high performing companies like a Skype or whatever it is, but some companies that go bankrupt. So your portfolio will be uh, very uneven. We can contrast that to um, another type, another type of uh, investment, which is um, expansion capital. And you can see there's very significant differences with expansion capital, which uh, involves, it, uh, you know, the companies are a bit better known, so it's not a question of discovering the company, although there is that to some extent. Um, in this case, the way we manage the portfolio is a bit different because now we have an existing company and it's more a question of scaling the company than developing it. And what we're looking for in our portfolio is we don't want to have any companies that go bankrupt we're not, we want companies to all be solid performers and, and, and kind of have an organic growth. So the, the way we approach the, the portfolio, uh, the way we manage the portfolio is very different between expansion and venture. Uh, the buyout uh, type of deal is, is quite different. Here we, what we're talking about is mature companies. And one of the important characteristics in buyouts is that uh, often the, um, the investment made by the fund doesn't go into the company as a capital increase, but rather it goes to buy the company. So, for example, if an American buyout fund buys, does a leverage buyout of a big company, they're buying it from someone else and not necessarily putting much new money into the company because the value creation is more to do with the change of ownership than, um, than by virtue of buying the company. Let me give you an example of that. A few years ago when I was managing my, my Soros fund, we purchased, um, we purchased from uh, Unilever in Turkey their vegetable oils business. And basically what happened is Unilever had just lost interest in their vegetable oil businesses. And so my fund was able to buy it from Unilever because they just weren't interested in it anymore. And we went, after we bought the business, we were able to re-motivate the management who had been sort of neglected by Unilever and we managed to double the EBITDA of the company in three years just by releasing some of the energy of the management who had been frustrated by having an owner who was no longer interested in them. And that's what something you get. So typically you might get a buyout situation coming out of uh, a non-core division of a conglomerate or perhaps a, a government-owned company which has been not managed properly.
or perhaps uh, a family-owned company where there's some succession problems uh, in, in, in the family, which has a knock-on impact on the company. But that's, that's not so much the case in Africa. Then uh, referring to mezzanine, mezzanine is a kind of a subset. It's kind of a specialist area, so you'll get, um, you'll get mezzanine funds. If, you know, a kind of rough rule of thumb in Europe is that for every, um, for every 10 or 20 uh, growth funds, you get one mezzanine fund, because mezzanine funds often work uh, hand in glove with equity funds. So, you know, an equity fund might find a deal <coughs> and, uh, uh, and, you know, it might be, you know, there might be a $20 million deal, for example, and they'll say, OK, we'll, we'll do $10 million as equity and let's call our friends at the mezzanine fund and they can do 10 million as a mez because it makes sense, that makes sense for the company. So mez funds will often work closely with equity funds or it may be the case that in emerging markets in particular that the equity fund will actually, the fund itself will actually uh, inject its investments. So uh, you, you may get funds who will put in part of their investment into a company as both equity and as a form of debt. Um, in parallel because it makes sense uh, for the deal. What are some of the key trends that you should be aware of uh, generally in the industry in recent years? I think um, two main things. Um, it's impact investment. So impact investment as you know means that you have a mission which is both to make sure that you invest your money at a reasonable profit, number one, uh, but you have a second objective which is you plan to do um, have a positive impact over and above, you know, the financial investment that you that you make. And so that um, we could spend hours talking about what impact investment means. And um, as you might imagine, because it's a sub asset class, which is developing, people have different ideas about that. But broadly speaking, from the point of view of private equity in emerging markets, uh, impact investment may have different connotations, for example, in the US, where it's also about you know, providing investments for disadvantages, minorities and things like that. But in, in emerging markets, impact investment is very strongly associated with lower mid-cap private equity. In other words, funds that invest with an impact mission uh, can be described from a private equity point of view as a lower mid-cap fund, like uh, managing, you know, 100 million or 10 million or whatever it is, and making impact type investments. Uh, and so, that's that's where that's where that's the point of view we should apply when we think about impact investment in um, in emerging markets. I think one of the debates that's still open in impact investment is is it really possible not to have any trade-offs between the um, the social objective and the financial objective, right? So, and if we look at the example of CDC, uh, they in-house they have a they have an in-house objective for their commercial fund managers of 12%, but what they designate as their impact fund managers, they have a, an objective of 3%. So CDC obviously allows for a trade-off between the returns and the impact. Some other people in the debate will say, that, no, there is no trade-off. And so clearly there's a, a sort of debate to be had, which is, still, which is still ongoing. And the evidence is still inconclusive. So it's probably gonna be some years before you can put together a conclusive body of evidence about whether there's a trade-off or not. So that, that's, one, that's, one kind of, that's one kind of important trend in the market. And um, <clears throat> the, second, um, the, second, uh, the second important debate that's going, which is even more recent than impact investment, is so-called ESG. Okay, ESG stands for Environment, Social and Governance. That's what it means. So environment means, you know, that the, the, your, in, your, in, your investment would have a benefit, a benefit on the environment. For example, like you would invest in, I don't know, a, a chemical plant. And then because you're a conscientious investor, you would uh, make sure that they properly treated their, their water waste and their effluents and polluted less. That's an example of environmental uh, improvement. Social impact means that you treat people better, uh, you know, employees or others. So, for example, the classic, um, the classic social impacts that um, we look at in Africa, for example, I did, uh, I did some work for African Development Bank as a, a private equity expert. And the, what they were looking for from their investments was the gender balance. So that they wanted to see that between the moment that the fund manager invested in a company and, you know, a few years into their investment, uh, 
what they were looking for was the percentage of females or women in the company increased. So that's an example of a social, a social, a social impact you might have. But there may be others like uh, minorities and, 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 other such, and other such treatments as well. So that's a social. Uh, and then governance refers to the company generally having a better level of governance, like having a board of directors that's functioning, or having a strong financial function and, 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 and so forth. So ESG is something that's been bandied around, especially in the last three, four years. And uh, it's, in kind of, it's in kind of development. And so uh, what, what's, what's going on now in the market is that uh, investors and others are saying that all uh, fund managers, even if they're not specifically an impact fund manager, should be let's say ESG compliant, and what's not so so everybody agrees in the market that everybody that a fund a fund should be should follow good ESG practices, but at the moment nobody can really agree what that really means. So there's a a, a kind of real debate going on uh, about that, but it's important that you know that that's going on, uh, and um, and and learn what you and learn more about it if you like. Um, so a few concluding thoughts uh, about the market overview, which is very much my take. I think um, the main conclusions we can draw about the private equity is that um, the long-term return of the asset class has been something like 10 to 12 percent on average. And there's mixed evidence whether it beats the stock market benchmark or not. There's some evidence that it beats it by two or three percent. There's other evidence that it doesn't. But, you know, that's not a huge, a huge variation. What is clear is that there's a big performance difference between the good fund managers and the bad. And another thing we do see is there is some degree of correlation between past and future performance. So a fund manager who is in the top quartile, some studies have shown that there is more likelihood that for the next fund, that fund manager will con continue to perform better. Now, the evidence for the connection between correlation between the past and the future is stronger in venture capital than it is in, in buyouts or expansion. And the evidence for correlation is stronger in emerging markets than in other markets, because other studies will show that over time, top quartile fund managers may end up falling down and bottom managers may end up going out. So there, it is a complex area, uh, but it's something you should, you should, be, you should be aware of. If you are interested to have a look at um, these uh, these YouTube videos, which uh, you know discuss a lot of the things that we've talked about in in a lot more depth.